episode of Fermented Adventure, the podcast, is brought to you by Fermented Adventure. Dolan, we have merchandise. Yes, we do. How do people find our merchandise? They need to go onto our website at fermentedadventure.com and click on the apparel tab. So go to fermentedadventure.com and click on the apparel tab, and what will they find? They will find our Fermented Adventure, the podcast shirt, may contain alcohol, and we have a couple specials that we just did. Uh, Cerveza made me do it, and tequila made me do it. Now, this is perfect for spring break, Cinco de Mayo, or even the summer, and you'll look really cool, and you'll be able to say, hey, it wasn't me, it was tequila or cerveza that made me do it. Yes, that's true. We have different things. We have shirts. We have glasses. What are some of the other things we have in there? Women's stuff, men's stuff, tank tanks, tops. Tanks, tees, sweatshirts, pullover hoodies, you name it. You name it. We have it and more to come, right? More to come. Fermentedadventure.com. Click on the apparel tab. Buy the merchandise. Cheers! Ladies and gentlemen, craft spirit enthusiasts, and those interested in the intoxicating world of craft distilleries, cideries, meaderies, wineries, and the occasional foray into breweries. It's Rich Shane, and welcome to Fermented Adventure, the podcast, where we bring you the fascinating people that are making the mash, fermenting, distilling, bottling, pouring, and delivering to you some of the finest libations in the world. Before we get started, here are a few housekeeping items. Thank you for bringing the podcast into wherever you are and whatever you're doing. We truly are grateful that you've chosen to listen and make us part of your day. It would mean the world to us if you left a five-star review. This helps us climb in the rankings and it makes it easier for others to find us. Don't hesitate to leave us your comments as well. If the podcast didn't meet your expectations, tell us why. We're always striving to improve. You can find us at fermentedadventure.com. We are on Instagram and Facebook as Fermented Adventure. Email us at fermentedadventure at gmail.com. All right, FA Nation, let's meet our guest. He's Brian Warner. I'm Rich Shane. This is Fermented Adventure, the podcast. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Now, we met at Triple Bottom Brewing years and years ago, it seems like. As Fermented Adventure, we're big fans of all things honey. We're big fans of mead. We're we're big fans of things that are aged, like whiskey that has been aged with a barrel that's had honey in it. We love all things honey. Caledonia Spirits, who is a guest on the podcast, they make Bar Hill Gin. Two ingredients, juniper and honey, and that's how they get their gin. So welcome to the podcast. I'm excited. And the first question I have for you is, what's your business and how did it all get started? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm... Thanks again for having me. Um, I'm obviously a honey fanatic too. Caledonia Spirits, uh, I've had their gin and their honey, uh, both of which are epic. I mean, Vermont has some of the best honey in the U.S. Um, but my job is to go around the world and meet with beekeepers. Um, that's abroad and here at home. Uh, and we work with them uh, to kind of facilitate uh, getting their products into new markets, right? And uh, on the other side of that is trying to show people that can use sugars or honeys um, what it means to have honey that can actually change the face of what you're making in subtle ways or in major ways. Um, you know, so we work a lot with breweries, with uh, meaderies, that's honey wine, um, we work with ice cream companies, chocolate companies. We uh, do wholesale uh, exclusively. Um, part of that is because I uh, worked for a small honey startup uh, out of Cambridge, Massachusetts when I moved back here from West Africa. And uh, I was doing retail there. But retail, and we can talk a little bit more about this, uh, is challenging when it comes to something like honey because honey doesn't go bad. It's one of the beautiful things about it and also one of the most awful things about it from a product perspective. If you're a beekeeper uh, and someone buys your honey and it's the most precious honey, you know, it's the best honey they've ever had, it's this precious thing. They don't want to consume it. They, yeah, per they perhaps, fond right? fondle it and okay. show it to people. And then, you know, it ends it's, up like, at, it's like my bottles of bourbon. <laughs> right. It ends up at the back of the pantry or, you know, it, it, they don't go through it. Right. So when are they going to come back and fill that jar back? I understand. Right. So the light bulb that went off for me was we need to 
get this stuff into people's hands that can showcase it in things that are perishable in beer someone opens a beer they drink the whole beer it doesn't matter if there's a teaspoon of honey in it right they're going to drink that whole can they're not putting it back in the fridge um, so what we wanted to do was think of how are we going to create sustainable markets for this stuff right um so anyway, that, that's World Honey Exchange. The point of that is to connect producers from around the world to markets and to let markets understand what they can do with these ingredients that they may never have experienced. For you, Brian, how did you get started in honey? I mean, you mentioned working for a beekeeper, right? An apiary? Uh-huh. How did the fascination or how did the just excitement for you to get involved in honey? Yeah, it was accidental. I mean, I... I after college, I traveled a little bit. I had somehow managed to save some money. Um, I went to Europe for a little while. Uh, just I worked on an apple and pear orchard for a little while in northern France. Then I was sort of a handyman at a hostel in Greece. Um, it exposed me to what was out there in the world um, in terms of culture a little bit, but also in terms of food. Um, Anyway, that, that was just a precursor to me coming back home to start my life. Uh, I didn't know what that would be at the time. And, uh, you know, I was looking, I have a bit of a finance background, but I, so I was looking at investment banking, but I also grew up in a town called Davis, California, which is an agricultural hub of the country um, and the world. I never thought I would get involved in agriculture, but the point is I started looking at opportunities for things that I could do that seemed interesting. And I stumbled across the Peace Corps. Um, and I think within six months of discovering it and applying, I was on my way to West Africa and uh, to Guinea. And I was an agroforestry volunteer, which, you know, didn't, it meant agriculture to me, but I really didn't know what it meant at the time. Um, that actually took me into a village uh, that was coastal and covered with cashews. Um, and cashews are a nut that grows from what's called a false fruit, grows from a tree. And when the nut is ripe, the fruit and the nut fall together. And that fruit is often left behind because the nut is the cash crop. That's what we all eat. Right? That's what we love as a nut. Um, but the fruit is super high in uh, vitamins and quite popular locally. Um, but it perishes very quickly once it hits the ground. And I wanted to figure out how to preserve it. So I tried pasteurization, but the only fuel we had available there was charcoal and wood. And... That just felt really inefficient to me. Um, the next thing I could think of was fermentation. So I started fermenting the cashew fruit juice. All right. Now, this is where I, I think part of this from fermented adventure standpoint, this is get exciting for us. Fermentation. You know, now you're talking about taking those sugars in the fruit and introducing a yeast to them. And talk about the fermentation process. Yeah, and I am. I promise I am coming back to honey and how I no. got involved in honey. But we're uh, talking about your story, and yeah. eventually it's going to meander there. It will, it'll and be it'll right sting there. us. It'll be, it'll be sweet. Okay, it won't hurt too bad. Fermentation just seemed like the simplest way to do it, right? Um, and it was, although we didn't have the technology available to do the extraction of the juice very effectively. I mean, we started with our hands. We were literally squeezing these things by hand, squeezing the juice out of them. And then I got a, a you know, I got a, a piece of equipment that would actually press the juice out of the, the, the fruit. Um, so we got more efficient. And then I was getting different kinds of yeast, right? I was bringing yeast over from I was champagne yeast, for instance. Um, I would bring over and we would ferment with that. Uh, we needed some kind of control because spontaneous yeast is so unpredictable. Um, and we really wanted to bring in a higher alcohol content to make sure that we weren't going to get uh, post-fermentation issues. So we actually 
had started producing the stuff and bottling it and we had a, a market. I mean, the market was military officers nearby us that were guarding a, a water station. Um, but that was an initial market for it. Uh, but there were some things in that area and in that community that where selling alcohol, uh, became a little bit abrasive, predominantly the fact that it was um, a Muslim country. That's frowned upon in the culture. It was. And now you're providing an economic source for them, but it still does not, it's not consistent with values and ideas. Right? Exactly. So it, it, it came into conflict with um, integration into the community, and I didn't want to put that in jeopardy. Right around the same time that that was happening, uh, I was invited to the Gambia uh, to participate in sort of a West African training of trainers on beekeeping because I'd been noticing the bees around the community. I had gained this interest in sort of beekeeping because I heard that other volunteers around the country had been beekeeping. And so 2013, I uh, went to the Gambia for a week and just did an intensive beekeeping training, participated. Then I came back and we built a couple catcher boxes and put them up. And the next day we had caught swarms of bees. Really? Like and, literally and this is, this is in Massachusetts or no, this, sorry, this is still in West Africa. This is still in West Africa. Okay. So the cashew stuff happened in West Africa, but at that same time I was looking at beekeeping uh, because there were bees all over the place. And then I was invited to this training in the Gambia, which is pretty close to, to Guinea. Okay. So I'm still in West Africa. Um, and yeah, we caught bees and that was kind of that. I mean, we just started building larger hives and uh, growing our apiary. So now I imagine so. you have a sustainable business there that the community can embrace mm -hmm. and this for them can be economically vibrant and you still have the idea of fermentation of the honey or the juice that's coming off the fruit from the cashews. Right. So. I transitioned almost entirely to honey at that point. Uh, it made too much sense. We had access to some technologies that most beekeepers in the area didn't have. I mean, people were working with very rudimentary tools and hive systems. So we also had access to information about how to manage the hives, right? So we could harvest the honey when it was ready to be harvested. We didn't need to intervene in inappropriate times or intervene in ways which would be detrimental to the colonies. Uh, this meant that we could build a, build a, we had a model for, um, an economic model that we could carry forward that was not gonna be abrasive to the community, but celebrated. Right, uh, that was my foray into sort of beekeeping, right? and I did that for two years in West Africa. That's where I started beekeeping. So the next segment that we're going to do on the Fermented Adventure podcast is we're going to do all your stories of when you're in Europe and when you're uh, in the uh, Peace Corps. That'll be because I'm, I'm sure you have some tremendous stories to share about your experiences. Taking the idea of now you've been doing honey and you've been a beekeeper, is this where you bring it back to the United States and become this becomes a business for you? I didn't know it at the time. I was evacuated from my post oh, wow. okay. in Guinea, right, as we were starting to get traction. Uh, the Ebola outbreak in 2012, well, there have been pandemics before the one that we uh, are currently going through. Um, that disease... None of us thought that would be the reason we would be evacuated. Um, we knew that there is a, a difficulty in transmission of that, meaning you had to get bodily fluids from someone that had it, whereas, you know, the current pandemic is airborne, so it's just a different ball game. But um, Ebola was, was a very nasty disease if, if, and scary if, you know, one was to get it. Um, but anyway, we were evacuated uh, right as I was coming to sort of the best part of my service, which was the end of it. Um, so I came back to the U.S. Um, for a little bit while they told us to wait to return to Guinea, uh, but that didn't end up happening because the, the outbreak continued to grow. Uh, I was invited 
and accepted back to Mali, which is a neighboring West African country. So I went there for six or seven months as a response volunteer uh, to help open reopen that post to regular volunteers because some years earlier it had been uh, evac that post had also been evacuated due to a military coup. So I went back to reopen that post. During that time, I decided I couldn't spend my whole life in West Africa. I needed to go into the next phase. Um, so I ended up applying to some grad schools and, and uh, that was a catalyst for me to return to, to Boston. Um, and in Boston, that's where I sort of stepped into the next phase of my education around honey. So what was that next phase or what was that next level for you where you really start to get deep into honey and bees and this becomes a business for you? Yeah, I mean, it started, I, I was living in uh, in Cambridge, in Harvard, just in Harvard Square. Um, I had rented a, a room from another volunteer who was out traveling and she sublet her room to me in Harvard Square. Well, I got squared away to prep for graduate school at Boston University. Um but she also told me I had to check out this shop called Follow the Honey. It was, you know, right in the square. And I managed to one day lock myself out of my apartment while I was taking out the trash. I'm cold and I thought, well, I've been procrastinating on this honey store long enough. I think it's time to go seek some How shelter. How fortuitous, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time to go seek some shelter from the cold and, and uh, also check out this shop. So I stumbled in there and I ended up meeting the owner and, you know... I spent the next three years of, of my time in Boston uh, completing graduate school and also working uh, with Follow the Honey to further their mission. And, and that took me to East Africa uh, to work on, you know, getting Miombo honey from partners there into the U.S. So I worked on the first uh, kind of commercial shipment of that. And uh, I also... Uh, got involved with uh, Youth Leaders of the Americas Initiative, which is a State Department-funded project that brings Latin American entrepreneurs together with American counterparts. So I hosted a uh, Colombian beekeeper and then did a reverse exchange down in Colombia and brought those partners in. Um, so I was working in different capacities in different places around the world to uh, start, you know, bringing honey into from A to B, right? And... Also going on at that time, doing retail honey out of a shop in Boston, I really learned about the market side of honey, how to taste honey, um, how to express honey, how people understand honey, what they think about honey, uh, their perceptions. So I got a ton of experience, uh, you know, both operationally and from sort of a marketing side of things. Um, and I think that really complemented the experience I had in West Africa where I was working on the ground with beekeepers in the bush so I could, you know, pull these two sides together. You really have. I mean, as you said, you're bringing the whole thing full circle to your experience, your knowledge from the business to the generation of honey. I'm thinking about an interview we did with Mead Maker Tyson and how, you know, dealing and working with different honeys and different methods of making mead. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about now all of the opportunity when you're bringing mead or you're bringing honey from, you know, this part of the world or this part of the world. Where did the World Honey Exchange come into play? I know you have your partner, your business partner, Jacob. Yep. How did all this become? All right. This is now going to be my focus. This is a business. Where did that start to come into play? Well, it was hard. I mean, I was working for, you know, this other startup and they were doing what they were doing and I was involved with that. And, you know, there, it was emotional deciding to step away and start my own thing. Um, it took time to decide that I needed to take it in another direction. And uh, Jacob I had met while I was living in Boston and... Um, he was also he also had a uh, like a retail honey company at the time, and he had stopped that at some point because of the issue we talked about at the beginning of the show, which was, you know, people when are, buy it. When are people going to come back and buy more? You know, <laughs> right? Um, so I told you know, look, why don't we loop your partners in Patagonia into this, and we'll work on some wholesale stuff with them if you want. That way, we're creating a market 
a new market for them. You haven't cut off the bridge to this market. They have cont continuity, uh, and they've got amazing honey. So he said, yeah, let's, you know, happy to play that role. And, and uh, he was living in Philadelphia at the time, and I was just trying to get my feet under me and figure out, am I actually going to do this? And so I came out here and, and uh, he put me up and I needed to open a bank account and I needed an address to do that. So we registered it here in Philadelphia at first and uh, there we were. We had a company and that was it. That was when I met you actually. It was the same time. Was that exactly you that were here the, starting that was the business? The, that was the and trip. you're walking around with so much honey. You have all these honey samples. You must have opened up like a dozen honey samples and it blew my mind. Yeah. And that was one of the things. Number one, your knowledge of honey, um, your enthusiasm for honey, and just all these honeys that I had never even heard about. There was one, I think it was a smoked honey or yeah. a that, – that just like – it, it just literally tasted like a and, and obviously you don't smoke it but it's just coming from as the bees are pollinating and doing their thing it just gives off that smoky you know essence right well and quite frankly you can get smokiness from uh, the botanicals themselves you can also get them from the beekeeping practices and that honey uh, was from is from a forest in Tanzania where the only agricultural activity allowed is beekeeping but the bees are very aggressive and the methods are still you know when you don't have proper equipment you rely on things like smoke to protect you okay so that actually that honey is slightly smoked that's due coming to off of that the exposure the yeah the practices of just trying not to get stung or swarmed on right yeah 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 so we met again at Triple Bottom Brewing. You were there with Jacob. That was the I didn't know that was the exact no, time you no. were setting up your business. Well, like I said, I've done honey tastings at five star hotels and with prime ministers, and I've done honey tastings on the Green Line in Boston. You know, it's it's you'll you'll taste where, honey anywhere. <laughs> yeah, 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 and and uh, you know, I like it. I like I like that um, people can taste something that they didn't expect and be blown away. And what I like about honey is it's a reflection of the botanicals in a given area in a given season, right? It's um, it's something that ref is a pure reflection of Mother Nature, if you will. I don't know another product that is so diverse and that can literally be found on every continent except Antarctica. You know, you can go into the jungles of the Amazon and give someone honey and they're going to know it's honey, right? The most remote places on earth, people still are familiar with what honey is. And there's not very many things that are like that. That's fascinating. I mean, technology-wise, it's still so rudimentary. It's bees taking pollen, making honey, and then those that forage or consume it, for whatever they're cooking or eating purposes, right? Right. I mean, there are other medicinal things I can I know that you can do with honey, but that's that's culturally or even environmentally, that's what they find in their own area. Right, and it's a form of medicine too. I mean, back the earliest forms of medicine, you know, are based on honey. We have stingless bee honey that is, you know, in, in Mesoamerica used to treat eye infections. Um, Manuka honey, which I have some right over here, uh, has all sorts of agents that have been tested for that. You know, you've got things that inhibit the growth of cancer. Um, now, Manuka has been treated especially well because the government of New Zealand has invested billions of dollars in sort of creating the systems and putting the systems in place uh, for the marketability of that to happen. But honey in general is a medicine, it's a food, and it's something that expresses a time and a place. All right. You mentioned that you teach people or you help people or you have understood now how to taste honey. Sure. Teach me how to taste honey. So there's a lot of ways one can do that. I mean, there's technical ways to do it like, you know, clarity, uh, taste, uh, texture, aroma, um, well, I feel like we're doing wine or, or whiskey now, but I it's, would never have thought of this approach to honey. It's as complex. Honey. It's yeah, as this complex, is, this is if tremendous. not more so. Um, aroma, right? Uh, you know, so you can smell. The first thing you might do is 
you know, smell it and, and take a look at it uh, just to see what, what the honey looks like. Now, the U.S. has systems for what we grading honey that um, I don't necessarily agree with entirely. I mean, in a lot of places, honey is not handled the same way that it is in the U.S. Um, we have honey from Ethiopia where our partners work. Uh, go out into the forests, um, rainforests, you know, they get over a, a meter of rainfall annually. Uh, and they hike for, you know, five plus hours to get into these forests to harvest honey. So when they get there, um, they're going to harvest it. They'll, they'll do an inspection first and then they'll come back and harvest it. But normally when we harvest here in the U.S., we wait for all of the honey comb to be capped so that we know that the moisture content of that honey has been brought down uh, in order that natural yeast don't start fermenting okay. the honey. If you've got a higher water content, you can sort of get that spontaneous fermentation thing going, right? Uh, this so when you say, and you're talking about grading of honey, now, is that based on the idea? In America, you said you know there's a level or different uh, categorizations of grading. Is it based on the purity of the honey? Is it based on what criteria that that, that grading right. system is? There's, there's, it's interesting, and in, in, in to my knowledge of it, it's the color, the taste, the texture, um, the clarity are effectively the main criteria. But it doesn't account, it doesn't have a control, right? Here's the thing. And we're going to go off on a little sidetrack here. Good. In the U.S., the main economic value behind beekeeping is the pollination services, not the honey. Okay. Right? So let's look at California almonds. California produces 70 plus percent of the world's almonds. Now, almonds require pollinators in order to produce a yield that is economically viable and to produce that or to bring in those pollinators means bringing in honeybees which are prolific pollinators I mean you've got 80,000 honeybee up to 80,000 honeybees in a hive and each bee can hit up to 200 flowers on a single trip right so and they don't stop working these things are pollinating non-stop Right? But almonds are not heavy nectar producing plants. They, their flowers just don't produce a lot of carbohydrates for the bees. So a lot of times beekeepers have to supplement the bees' food. Well, what do they supplement? Less so high fructose corn syrup now, maybe, but a source of sugar. Now, bees will still take that as nectar and convert that into honey. Honey, okay. Right? So, what is the end result? Well, we have honey, because it went through the enzymatic process that a bee puts it through, and regurgitating it, or throwing it up, if you will, uh, into what is now honey, and dehydrating it. But, what is that derived from? Other, yeah, other foreign that are not floral or flower-based properties, right? Exactly. So the expression is not going to be a reflection of an almond. You know, it's, it's a reflection of what the beekeeper fed the bee. So if you were to take the characteristics of what that almond flower might have, you're not going to get that full concentration because for that bee to then produce that honey... There's, as you said, it needs to be supplemented. Right. I mean, I'm looking at this. This says Indian cashew on it. And yeah. it, it looks like a, you know, so again, I'm the consumer, right? And I expect honey, I guess, to be thicker, more viscous, but this is a thinner honey. Yeah. Now, this has not gone through any processing other than, you know, just taking it out of the beehive no. and putting it into, or is there any filtration that goes on? Because you've got a second container there. That looks as if like it's now. This is crystallized. Is that what you would the technical term? Yeah. So this is not the, the cashew honey is not crystallized, and it's a higher moisture content. And actually, part of it, this is really interesting honey. It's got a higher acidity um, than most, and 
these bees are actually, we talked about bees foraging from flowers, but these bees are foraging actually from that fruit that we talked about. The cashew fruit. They're taking the juice of that, right? So that's a sugar source for them as well. And they are converting that juice as well into honey, right? So honey is not just derived from the flower, the floral nectar. Many times it is, but it can also be uh, from saps, right? It can be from juices of fruits. So, I mean, there's this whole push, and to me, I think it's so valuable right now, of people understanding the, the, the bees and how much we really depend on them for all kinds of pollination. And from that standpoint, they could you can leave fruit out, from what I'm hearing you say. Could you leave... You know, like a nectarine or a peach, and would that be then go to that and then draw the juice out? Potentially. Okay. Um, but you'd have to do it at a scale that – a vast scale. Gotcha. It's not just like, hey, I want to just feed the bees and just leave some I you mean, know, fruit out on the Right, backyard. and you could. I mean, they would probably come to it. Okay. Right? Now, bees will search out what they want to supplement their diet. So when we go back to bee health, there's a big thing about save the honeybees. Well – I'm not really concerned about honeybees because, yes, they pollinate a, a vast majority of our food, but they have trained humans, right, at this point to make sure that they do well. They face a lot of challenges, right? Varroa mites, plenty of diseases that are spread through that uh, parasite, right, that, that cause many issues for honeybees. And it's a challenge. The bees that are facing bigger issues that aren't talked about are the native pollinators. Apis mellifera, or the European honeybee, is not even native to the Americas. It came in here. <laughs> I'm picturing Thomas Jefferson or something yeah. being the one that brought them over initially or something. Or, you know, just, yeah, they, well, they made You it. had a lot of orchards that, you know, apple orchards. You had a lot of um, produ produce and mm -hmm. things that I guess they were used to having that they wanted to make sure that they reproduced or, or tried to grow. Well, here. there were native pollinators. We have countless native bee populations here, right? But they're much harder to manage, right? They're solitary bees. So you can't just take a box of 80,000 and, you know, move it from A to B and have it pollinate apples and then almonds, right? It's impractical. What we've done here is we've industrialized things. So bees fit very well into our model of monocropping. And the ones that have hurt from that are the, are the native pollinators because there's no diversity of forage, right? We talked earlier about honey being a representation of time and place. Well, if the only, if there's only one species of plant in that place and it only flowers for two weeks, and let's say that it actually produces nectar, pollen's important too because that's the protein for the bees. Mm -hmm. uh, nectar being basically the carbohydrate. But if they're only producing this for a short two-week window, well, what are the bees going to forage on the rest of the year? They're either going to go find another place if they're uh -huh. transient, right? Yeah. Or they're just not going to survive. Right. And the latter is really what's... This is... I See, I this is more than just about honey. This is like... You did... This is... To me, this is a PhD in honey and... <laughs> bee, this is... And... and I think you're the source. I mean, I don't know if you're like the go-to, you know, person on the world right now for for this information. No, but, I, but you should be. Well, I'm I'm an advocate for beekeepers that are doing the right thing by the bees, um, particularly around honey, because um, honey is that can, that link. I mean, we can talk about pollination. Uh, which is critical, but there's a lot of people that know a lot more about the science than I do. I mean, I didn't, st I studied, but I didn't study, uh, how, how do we call it? Um, you know, Charles Darwin was a naturalist, but he wasn't a formal, he, he wasn't formally educated on what he did. He did it through experience and observation. Right. I think that's how we really learn, right? And well, that's, that's, for me, this is why I enjoy doing the podcast. Right. This is my experience. I, this is not what I do, but now I get full of more knowledge. And what I always say, Brian, is that 
what transfers is now I have more of an appreciation for hunting. Those listeners of the podcast, when they're purchasing even honey at the grocery store, the farmer's market, or wherever they're getting their honey, will have more knowledge and appreciation for and, – and then now you can gravitate towards it. It becomes more of a story. What you provide – I mean I'm, I'm looking at this cashew honey from, in, from India, right? Yeah, that's from India. But now I'm going to think about you and the fruit from the cashew, and I have a whole new experience, a whole new appreciation for that. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. That's just tremendous. All right. I, I, I need to, teach, teach me how to taste this. You're not against tasting it, so no, smell no. it first. Why would I be against tasting? Mm. It, all right, it smells like I, I I just don't want to sound you know kind of uh, you know simplistic. It smells like honey. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's the floral notes of it, but that's what I get until I start you, you know start telling me what I'm supposed to be pulling out of this. And you're not supposed to be pulling anything. Okay, out of it. good. Then I'm doing this right. <laughs> this is the thing: is everyone think about wine tasting? Everyone yeah. tells you how it's supposed to be done. It comes right. down to something: do you like it or do you not? Oh, I love it. <laughs> and this is practical. There's so much education that goes on all the time about this stuff. For people to use things, consume things, they have to like it. Let's just keep it simple, right? I can tell people, and I can talk for hours about the details that we're talking about you know but and I used to point out characteristics of honeys but now I'd rather let people explore them themselves because then I get to learn just because my palate says one thing doesn't mean that person's palate says the same I mean you mentioned wine I I think you educate your palate Mm mm-hmm same thing with whiskey and bourbon and gin and, and all kinds of spirits that you can start right. to educate your palate that you're now tasting things or experiencing things that, you know, it gets beyond that simplicity of, hey, it's honey or it's, yes. it's that, right? And it's very complex, but we're going to taste this and you can describe it. I almost get, yes, I get the floral botanical notes, the sweetness of honey. But I also got this sour, te- te- like a sour mm-hmm. burst, almost like lime. Yep. And I almost thought in my head again, while I was nosing that, I almost got that citrus note on the nose. So when I was describing this honey to people, actually, when I was describing the fruit of the cashew, which is what this is derived from, I would describe squirt, let's say. Okay. You never have that citrus uh, lemon lime soda called squirt. Well, I had it when I was a kid and it reminded me of that. You know, I would say it was lemony or limey, right? If someone asks me, it has that character, that citrus. But you you call it out yourself. You know, I didn't have to load it for you. No, but there's that balance. Because sometimes by suggesting, then we're able to pull it out. Sure. I, I, and, or, or sometimes it's almost like... Oh, yeah, yeah, I taste it now, but maybe maybe you don't. But yeah. see, now, the, the first thing here is when we're tasting honey, when we're looking at honey, again, as you said, we're looking at the um, the color, the, the the moisture content, and you're, you're getting a little bit of the nose on that. For, for this coming from India, and so how do you find this? How does this come to you? I mean, are you actually traveling to meet the beekeepers or the producers? Yes, definitely, because um, one of the issues with honey is just there's a lot of adulteration, which we talked about earlier with beekeepers. Wait, is that, is that bee, bee sleeping with... No, that's <laughs> adultery. Never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> I like it. I, like it. I mean, it's effectively people... They're Man- adding water or they're adding something else to the flavor profile. They're manipulating honey. Okay. Right? They're either doing it before the it's turned into honey by feeding the bees something. Gotcha. Or they're doing it after the fact by blending that honey with something. Um, and, and what we care about is knowing... Who are producing these right. things. So when you're sourcing, you're actually, like you said, you're traveling all over the world still to meet where they're producing this. So you right. know that if you take them on as a client and right. you're now going to distribute their honey, you know exactly it is in the jar. I went to the hives that this honey's from. Wow. Yeah. You know, and I won't do that every time we do a ship, but you have to establish trust and you have to know what's going on on the ground. And I'm sure, and you can tell me, could you taste the difference now knowing that? If they were 
changing and adding things? Could you figure that out? You Maybe think? there's depending. You taste honey at, at this stage. I tasted so much honey. I you know taste things that I like and I don't like, or that remind me of things. Okay. <laughs> that you know teddy bear honey off the shelf. I'm not saying all honey that you buy out of a grocery store is bad. There's a lot of good honey coming into grocery stores now. Um, but there's a characteristic honey, quote unquote, taste that we get when we go buy a big jug from Costco or we go buy the teddy bear from, you know, the grocery store down the street or Walmart. Let me ask you, because that's a good point, because it says on the container, 100% honey. Now, is it 100% honey? But then you bring into the point about, well, they could have those bees feeding off of, let's say, corn syrup mm-hmm. or other, you call them carbohydrates. Yeah. So it's 100% honey. It doesn't mean that that's 100% the nectar from wherever they're grabbing it from. Exactly. That's fascinating. Exactly. All right. So now as a consumer, I am so much more educated. Even if it says 100% honey, I have to ask. Is this 100% Technically, it's honey in the USDA's eyes because it went through the bee's enzymatic process and became honey. Gotcha. Right? That's the... So, when we're talking about grading honey, it's hard because there's all these elements um, that can throw it off. I've met a lot of people that say they don't like honey. It's like people that say they don't like gin. I mean, it's the same thing, right? (laughs) Because... Well, it has... You know... What you think honey is. Right. Why don't you like it? What was your experience with it? Now, this one here, is it crystallized? Is that what has happened? Yes. This? And the top is slightly fermented. Okay. Ooh, cool. So, you can smell that one. It's aromatic. Oh, yeah. You get the yeast notes on that? Yeah. Now, I like that. Yeah. I, I, I'm not that I didn't like that, but the fermentation... Wow. So how did that how did that ferment? It had a little higher water content. What happens with this is So this is like mead. Honey would sit out, then it would ferment, and that's how we have the most original consumed yeah. alcoholic beverage and out there. It, you know, water gets into it, right? Let's say. Well in this case, water wasn't completely taken out of it by the bees. Uh, it was maybe harvested a little bit like early. you said, the the comb wasn't capped. Yes. And there was moisture in there. Right. So this is naturally fermented honey. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And, and you can see the sugar, the crystallization comes up. That's all sugar. That honey is good. Okay. The, the, the higher moisture, the water, honey is denser than water. So what happens is you get that water layer coming up to the top, right? And you get the fermentation happening on the top. Like, this is all good. Honey. Why, why? So, help me understand, because I always. Why does this? Why does some like I'll buy a honey and it'll crystallize, and I'll buy another honey and it won't. And if it's warmer, it doesn't. But I, why does why does honey crystallize? And it's still good. It's just a sh- changing of sugar crystals. Really? Right. Think about when you like melt down uh, chocolate sh- sugar or chocolate sugar okay. to make uh, uh, fondant or um, candy, right? Okay. And then it rehardens. You know, maybe you're adding something to that. But generally what happens is it liquefies and then it hardens. Same concept going on here. Gotcha. But there's water. And, and again, what, we, what we're told or what I understand is there's nothing wrong with it. Right. You can heat it up a little bit yeah. just to kind of bring those sugars back into a yeah. liquid, right? And you've got – honeys will crystallize at different rates depending on a few factors. Um, honey is a high, high percentage sugars, right? But it's different types of sugars. You know, you, the main ones being fructose – and glucose, right? The higher glucose ones tend to be a little bit less sweet than the, the higher fructose ones. And the higher glucose ones also tend to have that uh, transformation of sugar crystals occur more rapidly. Okay. Well, let's taste this one because now yeah. my, my mouth is watering. Yeah. There <laughs> we go. I'm going to get you some of the, the fermented and some of the crystallized in there, so... Oh, my God. I get, like, while well, I get it on my leg. It happens. I get, I get like, a berry, like a blueberry flavor out of this. Mm-hmm. Um, Some people get, like, notes of rose, uh, like, uh, rose perfume. There's that, like, rose water. This is something. So, all right. Where, what's your market for this? Because you mentioned breweries and, and all kinds of things. 
and and you also said, look, we need to find a way that somebody's not just going to buy this and put it on a shelf mm -hmm. and covet this, and it's only becoming a special occasion thing. How do you now introduce this into other producers? Yeah, this is a this is a fairly delicate honey. So um, we've got this concept of delicate floral. We've got these notes to describe things. The intensity of character, both in taste and smell, from a honey, right? This honey is very aromatic, but it's, uh, it's, I've found it to be a very delicate honey. Those subtle notes that you get can be lost if you work with it inappropriately, right? Um, people using this are doing traditional meads, right? That means they're doing it with honey, water, and yeast. They're not adding other things. Yeah, because to you it. really don't want to, like, if you're doing a beer, you don't want to, I mean, I can see maybe adding some hops to this. And or you don't, but you don't want to over the, the star of the show is this honey. Yes. And we've had mead. And I think that mead producers that make the mead, the, the honey, the star of the show and find that balance. That's where their meads excel. Yep. If you try to over flavor mead because of that, maybe that consumer that doesn't like mead, but or doesn't like honey, but doesn't really know it. Then you try to hide that flavor. I think that's where you lose the character of what mead's supposed to be. Yeah, and I think we can back up a little bit and say, well, it's hard here because a lot of the honey is not... You're starting with a product that is not great. Right. Right. So you don't have the same character as something like that you would start with. Right. Right. So people start with honeys that are not necessarily going to be that dynamic. So you want to make it taste good. So what do you do? You start with a, a base honey that maybe is not very high quality, and then you start adding fruit and spices and all these other things to it. Makes sense. I mean, it makes sense to what you would want to do if you can't extract yeah. the, the whole honey flavor. But as you said, I somebody makes a meat out of this, I, I would love that all day. Yes, it's phenomenal. Uh, that right there is... All right, well, what is that as you're pointing to things? <laughs> Sorry. That is not honey. It's sizer. Okay. Uh, and it's fermented with honey that was steeped with THC, with, with buds... And also Gateme, the honey that we just tasted. Okay. Now, who makes that? That's a friend of mine who does all the R&D for the honeys that I bring in. He ferments uh, three to five gallons of every honey that I bring in using different yeasts. All right. So, this is just a – is this a home kind of a situation we're talking yeah, or is this a business? this is informal uh, fermentation going on. So, now that, we've promote, now that we've promoted this, it's nothing you can get on the market. <laughs> Uh, not yet. There's talk of it happening just because, um, it's so he, good. He, he loves making meat and, uh, he loves honey and he, he takes good care of it. So, um, all right, where are we going next on this journey here? Well, we can taste a little more honey if you're not against it. Why would I be against trying more honey? Um, what else do you have? But that, Honey that we tried. Did you say that was from Ethiopia? It's from Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Yeah. So and, uh, again, how do people connect with you? How do people find you? How are you opening up? You know, either finding uh, beekeepers or honey producers or those that want to purchase what you're producing, or yeah. or, or um, you know, when you're in a industry and you've been in it for a, a while, people have a way of finding you. Okay. Um, do you have a website? We have a website. To somebody world, signal? World, Worldhoneyexchange.com. <laughs> you can't buy honey through it. Okay. Um, there's, that's done intentionally. Um, we, we really want to work with our clients to uh, help them help add value for them. That means I've learned so much about fermentation, um, both, you know, beer, mead, uh, you name it. It's been amazing, but we want to make sure early on while we're building the foundation of this thing that we are really working closely and catering to each and every one of our our clients, particularly because we want to make sure they have this story of where this stuff's coming from and also, you know, how can they best apply it to what they want to make. Talk about some of the, are you allowed to talk about some of the meat makers or the brewers that are working with your honey? Uh, you know, I, I, I suppose so. Um, we there's some mead makers on the West Coast that are getting ready to release their first batches of of kind of global honeys that we provide, um, and we're really excited about that. I mean, to have top 
mead makers, renowned people in their communities working with these honeys and getting really excited about them is awesome. I mean, that's what we want to do. We want to give people the inputs to allow them to take mead to the next level, right? Um, but there's some breweries, too, that we can talk about. Um, Deschutes in Portland, Oregon, um, and Bend, they've been testing with our stuff. Lamplighter in uh, Cambridge, Mass, was you know, our first customer. They've been doing some really amazing honey beers. I mean, they keep blowing my mind uh, by continuous improvement and figuring out how to add honey into the process at different stages, how to work with it in different ways. Uh, you know, so this information comes back to me too and it allows me to inform other people about how they might use these things. See, and it, and it builds on itself, right? I, I think what you do is you help to bring that producer up to the next level by bringing in quality ingredients and ingredients that have character and flavors that are not readily accessible here in the United States or where you bring that avenue of finding something that nobody else can grab, that's where you raise that to the next level. I think that's exciting. I, I, if, if I'm a brewer or if I'm a mead maker or even if, as you said, a sizer, if, if, if I'm producing cider, why don't I want to add that natural sweetener into that right. and, and and create even more of a flavor profile. Yeah. I mean, honey, you know, has so many, e even with what we think about, this is, like, like you said, you, it's the ingredient, but it's where are the bees discovering, you know, where are they getting their proteins from? Right. Where are they getting their nectar from? Right. It's this mind blowing. Yeah. And, and the international community just has so much to draw from. Because a lot of the places that I work haven't been industrialized agriculturally in the same ways, right? I mean, I started, you know, working in Tanzania, seeing the Miomba woodlands. We'll try some, some of that smoky honey you talked about. Oh, please do. Um, <laughs> I drove all this way to get some smoky honey. Yeah, well, here you go. <laughs> You, to recreate you don't have this to go experience any further. Now, how to like again? Th this isn't something that the consumer can find on the market, right? Um, not readily. It's hard to find this stuff. Wow. Um, it almost has like a burnt, mm -hmm. a burnt nose to it, like uh, a caramel. But there's there's also this this baking spice on the nose, a little bit to it. I would say actually for retail, if you want retail mm. honey like this, there's there's some companies that do it. Um, uh, follow the honey, based out of you know Cambridge or well, uh, now just Massachusetts in general. Followthehoney.com, dot com. Um, Forested Foods, uh, we work with them um, and they they do retail stuff um, for the Ethiopian honeys. But by and large, you can't find this kind of stuff readily at the grocery store. No, this is like, to me, this is like that next level. Like if I can find like these specialty wines and specialty whiskeys and specialty, I want specialty honey like this. This is awesome. Now you brought this jar out. What's this one that you popped up Oh, there? well, because we've been talking so much about international <laughs> okay. uh, honeys to, to say that there's honeys here in the U.S. that, uh, you know, are also fantastic. You know, we work with some producers in New England that have some really incredible honey. Um, and I'm on my way down to Louisiana to visit a beekeeper uh, in a swamp down there, the Atchafalaya River Basin. Um, so this is Tupelo honey, uh, the famous Tupelo uh, that you hear, you know, sung about in songs. Uh, but... You know, it's, it's not to say that there's not really excellent honey in the U.S. It's just it's really difficult to find. I'm just saying, where do we find these producers, whether they're nationally or international? Unless you unless you kind of go to a farmer's market or mm – -hmm. but, but you, we're not going to find that same experience. Farmer's markets are good ways to find local producers that have good stuff, you know. But That is juicy. Yeah. That's like a juicy IPA. Oh, my God. <laughs> it is. But it's uh, honey. That's tremendous. Where is – what do you see for your company? What what does it, what do the next couple of years look like for your business? Um, we're continuing to bring partners on and in. 
Um, we are getting up to speed and making sure the supply chains, I don't want to throw around this jargon, you know, but we're just making sure that the systems are working, that we're getting quality honey. We can deliver it to people that want to use it and continuing to educate the communities. Um, this is not, honey is not a product that you can just be like, okay, I'm bringing in good honey and everyone's going to switch to it. There's too many substitutes. People can go get dextrose or, you know, high fructose corn syrup or sugar. There's so many options for it. And then you can also get low quality honey. You can get honey that is from over there, over there. You know, so to draw people to these things, people really have to understand Brian, the possibilities. I, if I characterize this, we would say it's craft, right? It's craft beer. It's craft whiskey. This is craft honey. Would you I, say that? I mean, and, and if I want craft, I'm going to seek it out. It's sad that this has to be described as craft now. To me, I it is. But maybe that's a branding or maybe that's the way that you now draw people into something that right. they have a better education. What you've done for me, this is this has been a tremendous education. This has been so enlightening. And as I said, my appreciation for honey and what you do has been raised exponentially. Well, it's thanks to the beekeepers. It's thanks to the bees. It's thanks to these ecosystems. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think a big part of what, I, what we wanted to do was connect the, the producers and the people that are using these things better. Okay. We wanted there to be this medium of exchange uh, to educate not just about honey because honey is just the mechanism but about relationships and about culture and place um, that needs to happen there's no excuse really in 2022 that we can't work on that kind of thing people have traditionally and I get talked to by my partners too about divulging our, our supply because it's easy for once someone knows who you're getting it from potentially to go behind you and you know do something else but you know we've we've operated historically on this idea of trust and doing what we say we're going to do and I don't feel bad if someone goes and gets the same source of honey if they have to now meet us at the same bar that we're bringing they have to pay the prices we're paying or they have to come through the way that we come through paying the beekeepers up front for what they do you know supporting them technically if we can uh, telling their story right so if if people want to go and do that and the beekeepers sign on to that is great and we did some we did our job really well um, but it is with something like honey it's a grind you, you can't snap your fingers people have to be educated and the education doesn't come from you're very receptive you know this is what you, you're a learner you're right you're a, yeah no I, I understand and that's why to me it's fascinating and the information and and the experience that you've been able to share today I, I appreciate that I'm grateful for your time and as I said I mean hopefully it helps to amplify and hopes to magnify the stories of those beekeepers right. and the honey and what it takes to get from just pollination and a flower into a jar somewhere or into right. a beer somewhere or into a bottle somewhere. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. I mean, that's what the hope is. And, and I think the best way to do it is to show people. And the way that we show people, we stick by the people that we work with and help them help themselves and, and, and have, provide a better experience for their customers by being able to use some of this stuff and make it shine through, you know? Um, and, and when people start doing that, people take note, you know, take the high road because it's not often traveled. Right. And well, I mean, because it's hard, it right? Is. What you're doing is hard. What your experience of doing, you didn't take the easy road. You could be a mass producer of honey, go to some place and talk about all the ways you adulterate the honey and all those things. But that's not who you want to be. That's not the story you want to 
communicate, right? Right. The story is not ours. It's it's the people that are using it and the people that are producing it. Brian, I'm grateful for your time today. And this has been a treat. I mean, not just the honey, but you sharing your story, the story of the beekeepers, the story of how we get what we do. And I, I don't mean to echo that a, a number of times, but I think it's a story that hopefully people listen to and share. And I'm grateful for your time today. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, once we sign off, we can pop this other bottle. Okay, let's do that. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you.